Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Benedict Bolter from the Secretariat of the Network for Improving Quality of Care for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health. Welcome to this second webinar in a series on delivering quality essential maternal, newborn and child health services during COVID-19. Today's morning, good afternoon, good evening, to... everybody. Uh, my name is Benedict Bolter. <laughs> I apologize for that. This was the, the live on, on YouTube. Welcome to the second webinar in our series on delivering quality essential maternal newborn and child health services during COVID-19. Today's session is going to be on emergency triage and assessment. The series is co-hosted by the Network for Improving Quality of Care for Maternal Newborn and Child Health and the QOC subgroup of the Child Health Task Force. In terms of proceedings today, you will see that you are all muted. However, we would like you to engage with the panelists through the chat box at the top uh, right corner, the bottom right corner of your screen. So while we have the, the presentation, which will last about 30 minutes, please type your question and your comments for the panelists. And in the second half of the webinar, we'll be reading out the questions for the panelists to, answers, to answer. Please feel free to type all questions. If we do not have the time to answer them all today, we will direct you to a committee of practice to continue the discussion. And we hope you will be joining. You can see the link to join in the slide that's currently on your screen. In addition, um, we'll encourage you to please yeah, join the committee of practice. Finally, um, we are recording this session. We will also be sending you a link later today with the recording and all the presentation of today's sessions. Um, I'm now handing over to one of today's facilitators, Dr. Bletha Malici, who is a technical officer in the Department for Maternal, Newborn, Child and Adolescent Health and Aging at the World Health Organization in Geneva. Bletha, please. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us in the second webinar on delivering quality essential maternal, newborn, child, and health services during COVID. This is a joint webinar organized between the Network for Improving Quality of Care for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health. That is a collaboration among 11 countries and over 30 partners who are working together to have maternal, newborn, and child deaths in facilities by 2022 by improving quality of care. And the Child Health Task Force, that is another partnership that is comprised of over 100 organizations, including government agencies, NGOs, multilateral and bilateral academic institutions, as well as consultants. Next slide, please. So why quality of care and why quality now? Quality matters, and this is very important to acknowledge, especially in the current context of COVID. We have seen that in the last few months, uh, effectiveness, safety, timeliness, equity, and integration, together with efficiency, and the people-centeredness uh, aspects of quality have been strongly undermined by the epidemic. At the same time, we know that those countries that were better prepared, that were uh, providing quality care that meant having all these components in place are coping better with the epidemic. In this context, we are organizing this series of webinars and I'll hand now over to Dr. Pavani Ram, a Senior Medical Advisor, Child Health in USAID, to take us through the objectives of today's webinar. Pavani, over to you. Thank you very much, Flerta. Next slide, Benny, please. So in this series, uh, this is the second session, uh, we're aiming to highlight the need for and the opportunities actually to maintain and strengthen maternal, newborn and pediatric quality of care during this COVID-19 pandemic and the response. And as much as we would also like to share global guidance, we're really interested to learn from countries on approaches to maintain quality essential MNCH services, which is why today we have an opportunity to hear from 
our partners in Sierra Leone and Pakistan. Next slide. So our focus today is on emergency treatment and triage with a particular spotlight on pediatric care. As you've already heard, we'll, um, we've heard from Dr. Blair Tamalici and myself, Cotton Rome, um, and together we have been collaborating with Dr. Ted Balastigeti, Haile Gabriel, and Dr. Anna Dechen. So we have first an overview of ETAC, Emergency Triage, Assessment and Treatment Plus, and the considerations in this context of COVID-19. We'll be hearing from Dr. James Bunn from the WHO Country Office in Sierra Leone. We'll have then reflections from Sierra Leone on adapting triage and assessment in this time of COVID in a pediatric hospital. We'll hear from Dr. Nellie Bell from the University of Sierra Leone Teaching Hospitals Complex. And then we'll move to Pakistan to have some reflections on remodeling pathways to care for children in a hospital setting. We'll hear from Professor Junaid Rashid from the Children's Hospital and Institute of Child Health, Lahore, and triaging and managing patient flow for newborns from Professor Nusrat Shah Kamal, Dow University of Health Sciences, Karachi. And then we'll end with the Ask the Expert session, during which we'll be able to address your many comments and questions. So please do share your um, comments and questions in the chat box uh, through the presentations, and we look forward to an engaging session. Over to Dr. Bunn. Uh, thank you. Um, I think slides are slightly slow in advancing, so we will um, uh, progress, but people may need to be catching up a little. Um, so I'm going to talk about emergency triage assessment and treatment, plus uh, considerations in the context of COVID-19. Next slide, please. So the aims of ETAT Plus are to reduce neonatal and childhood mortality, improving recognition of the sick child and reducing time to treatment. Uh, it is empowering health professionals to provide life-saving emergency care as they arrive in the hospitals. So uh, improving the quality of care for pediatric emergency admissions. It takes a systems approach in the hospital, understanding each unit's processes any bottlenecks and delays, and the flow of patients through the unit. It includes other departments, including the laboratory and pharmacy, and it is part of a series of ongoing quality improvement processes, which may link into hospital QI. Oh, next slide. So in a, a country, ETAT guidelines are developed as national guidelines owned by the national uh, uh, team, and there is usually an ETAT working group. Uh, the agreements uh, on guidelines are made in conjunction with national malaria treatment guidelines helping babies breathe or other guidelines available in country. And these are then adapted uh, uh, for local use. And often the WHO Blue Pocket Book is used as a source of information to guide on treatments as well. And so one creates national guidelines for emergency care, and these will include wall charts, guideline booklets, and often a training manual uh, uh, for ETAT. So the next slide, please. Um, so the process uh, we're going to talk about in today's seminar is very much around the front end of this, around triage and assessment. Triage being the identification of children with priority and emergency signs. And as part of this, and you will see it starts on the top right hand side with S, and S is around the setting, that the setting has to be safe uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the staff and for the patient. And we have other elements uh, that you stimulate the patient, you shout for help, and you regard the setting that you're within. Uh, and this has context for uh, COVID as safety of staff and patients is critical now while we're in COVID. And then we have assessment, which is structured on the normal airway, breathing, circulation, disability stru uh, structures. And in Sierra Leone in 2015, ETAT was introduced into the uh, uh, large teaching hospital, which Nellie Bell works at. And we assessed before the uh, introduction of ETAT, the time it took for patients to be assessed uh, after triage and the time after triage to their first treatments of say a life-saving intravenous therapy. And we saw before this, that there were long delays over three hours before patients were getting their first treatments. And after a process of looking at the structures and the flow of patients and the ability for, uh, for uh, staff to treat patients on arrival, these were reduced down uh, to under half an hour. 
So significant improvements in speed of care. Next slide, please. So in the context of COVID, um, we have some challenges. Hospitals may be stigmatized, and as a result, patients may delay coming and so come late. There are new triage processes being introduced for COVID, which have the potential to further delay patients arriving for life-saving treatments. We have increasing needs for IPC and PPE uh, um, for staff and for patient safety. And patients with suspected COVID will need new flow processes and directions in the hospital where they may go. COVID may cause isolation of staff uh, because they acquire infection, and some may be quarantined if they're contacts. Some hospitals and emergency departments, both in Sierra Leone and elsewhere in the world, have closed as a result of this with impact on the ability to care for sick patients. And focus and resources of, uh, uh, of staff at national level and at facility level may be diverted into COVID. So it is in the context of this that this uh, uh, webinar is being created uh, so we can look at the experience of, uh, of Sierra Leone and Pakistan in how we've had to redirect flow. And as, as we will be taking questions uh, during this webinar, uh, and I would like people to focus on the flow and the ETAT components and the impact of COVID on these uh, in, their, in, in the discussions we have afterwards. So I'm not seeking to look at the uh, um, treatment of COVID or of other elements about the management of COVID in children. This is a, a webinar around how COVID has affected the flow of patients and the, and the management of ETAT in the context uh, we have now. Uh, and I'll hand over now to Dr. Bell, uh, who is a consultant uh, at Oladurin Children's Hospital in uh, Freetown, Sierra Leone. Uh, she's also uh, a medical director and works within the university teaching home complex uh, in Sierra Leone. Over to you, Nelly. Yes, uh, thank you very much, James. Good morning, everybody. And um, thanks for um, making me, uh, to allow me to participate. Uh, um, in my presentation, uh, I will be showing how um, our patient flow at the Ology and Children's Hospital has evolved. And um, since we, we learned from the past, I wanted to show you a few slides uh, as to what we did before Ebola, after Ebola, and now uh, for the COVID pandemic, as we all learn uh, from, the, from the past to build on the future. Now quickly, Olojuin is a tertiary, the only pediatric tertiary hospital in Sierra Leone. We see approximately, where well, we admit approximately 12,000 children annually. It's a 200 bed facility and um, we have inpatients and as mentioned and also other outpatient facilities. Before Ebola, we had uh, one single entrance to the hospital um, and um, for the patients, staff and everybody. And um, uh, we had all of the wards in the main hospital next to the maternity hospital. However, during Ebola, we had the challenge of the one entrance for all. And so we had patients uh, come with, with Ebola coming into the hospital and infecting the rest of the, the staff at the hospital and the other patients. So we created another entrance by the side. We asked for the land next to the hospital and we created another entrance, which is on the right hand of your screen, um, for the patients. And the patients were then screened for Ebola in this corridor. If they, were, if they showed signs and symptoms of Ebola or met the case definition, they were then taken to the isolation unit, um, as you can see at the top of your screen. We, the patients that did not meet the, the, the case management were triaged here and, uh, and screened again. And if they did meet it, they were sent to the isolation unit. And those that did not meet the case management, uh, case definition for Ebola then, were sent to the main hospital all the way down here. Uh, it, you can imagine if the patient had emergency science or priority science, as uh, James had explained before, taking them all the way to the main hospital uh, was, was very difficult in terms of patient care. And we found out that we lost a lot of patients during that time, which is why we created, um, we went on and created a new emergency room or resource area next to the triage area. So we did the ETAT-based uh, uh, triage, ETAT-plus-based triage, and those patients that met the, the that had emergency science and priority science were take, taken straight to the resource area here and managed. And we found out that that improved um, um, our patient care and that uh, improved on mortality. Um, James mentioned the study that we did 
um, I'm I'm just showing it again just to just to tell you that uh, or just to reiterate that it it takes a complex multidisciplinary effort um, in when there's an outbreak um, for us to have adequate uh, patient care um, and adequate patient flow. So it took a reorganization of processes and systems, including a robust training of the of ETAT Plus of the staff um, on on ETAT Plus, especially the nurses who are there um, and uh, uh, um, at the front line, and, and also the doctors. In 2019, quickly we found out, though, however, that this wasn't working anymore. On your right bottom screen, you see the at the beginning the couches were all nice and new, and the makeshift area was nice and clean. However, in 2019, it was all um, uh, dilapidated. It was not a conducive um, atmosphere for the staff and for the patients. So we decided to, to move back to the main hospital, move the emergency room back to the main hospital and create an entrance here. So the patient's entrance was still the same. We did the, the ETAT triage here. Those that met the case, case definition were taken into the hospital. And we had a two bed small um, isolation unit here. Uh, so we were quite proud of ourselves and we were happy However, um, as you can see here, the beds are quite close to each other. So this was the new emergency department. The beds are quite close to each other. And uh, for the next step, which was uh, the next uh, um, uh, pandemic or the next uh, uh, problem facing us was is the COVID in 2020. So we had to change that um, all over again. So what did we do? In February, we started with... Um, with the COVID-19 force, uh, COVID-19 task force, as I mentioned, we needed a complex multidisciplinary effort. So we had all departments represented in that COVID-19 task force, and we communicated regularly with the Ministry of Health. That is very important, and um, also equally as um, almost as equally as important are the donors. We communicated with them um, on a regular basis. We created SOPs um, um, and general SOPs, case definition, patient flow. Uh, and case management according to the ETHOS Plus. Um, however, on the 1st of April, uh, the first case, the first positive case of COVID um, in the hospital um, evolved and we were somehow caught off balance because that was the second positive case in the whole country. So we didn't, we hadn't had many cases in Sierra Leone yet. And this and this first positive case in the Olodurian Children's Hospital, of, unfortunately, was myself. And, um, and I had to be taken away and locked up for a while. So um, we, we, were, we had to shut down the hospital. So after I came out and after we reopened the hospital, we made sure that the hospital was thoroughly cleaned. Most staff were tested and only those tested were allowed to work um, because the whole hospital was already contaminated. Uh, we downsized the number of hospital beds. The hospital staff, we trained them afresh on IPC uh, measures um, and we, we implemented, we disseminated the SOP and we started implementing the SOP. Now, what did we do? Now, this diagram is 180 turn from the previous diagrams we had because I, would I wanted to, to um, show you the treatment, the isolation and treatment area of the Olajuwon Children's Hospital and, and how we, and the patients flow generally. So the gate is no longer on the bottom right, it's at the, on the top left. Um, so this is, as you can see my pointer, this is the gate. So we have the patients coming in so this is the main hospital again. The staff will come in in this gate over here. The patients come in uh, um, this way. They're screened, they their hands are washed. The security uh, uh, sees them and they, they wash their hands, make sure they wash their hands. And, um, and they, they're given a cloth mask. And the patients are screened for COVID-19. It's not just the patients, but the, the caregivers as well are screened for COVID-19. Um, if they don't meet the case definition, they're taken uh, straight to the new, remember the new emergency room um, we told you about. And in that new emergency room is where we had the, we now have the triage for the non-COVID suspect patients. For those COVID suspect, suspect patients, uh, they are then taken right down into the area of the, um, the isolation unit. Um, and there again, we, um, we, we created a triage area. And registration area. So this triage, it's as, as I mentioned before, is all ETA triage, and the nurses are all very well trained in that. And then we have an emergency couch here, uh, just in case uh, we had the, the patient had emergency signs that we had to stabilize before taking into the units. So we have three areas: one, uh, two for suspected cases, and one for confirmed cases. So when they're tested positive, 
So when they're brought in, they're tested quickly and we actually get a, a good turnover of the, of the test, 24 to 36 hours, we receive the results. And when they're confirmed positive, they're taken to this area. For critical patients, they stay here. For non-critical patients, they're taken to another area where they can be managed. So in terms of compartmentalization, um, we decided to compartmentalize the whole hospital. So now when we have a suspect case in the, in, in that tests negative, so we decided it could be, also could be false negative. So what do we do with these patients? So we decided to move these patients. So these patients go out, they doff, and then they, they use this entrance and they're taken to the ICU and ER area. Those that are non-COVID uh, suspect patients in the first place are then taken to the step-down area, to the to Ward 3 area, and to the malnutrition units. The malnutrition units will have ever contained patients that have been tested negative and also patients that um, are coming from the, the um, resource area. However, um, we, we, we compartmentalize the malnutrition units as well so that one area is for patients coming from the, the, the isolation unit and um, the other areas of patients coming from the resource area. So in other words, all patients coming from the resource who were not suspect cases in the first place are taken to these wards. All patients um, that, are, that were originally suspect cases but were, were turned out negative, they have respiratory signs, they're then when uh, moved from the isolation unit are taken to the ER and ICU area. So they're not mixed with those patients taken to the step down or ER and ICU. For the special care baby units, um, just quickly, um, the, the babies from the, from the inborn, from the maternity hospital are taken, if, if I go back to the slide, from the maternity hospital are taken to the special care baby unit directly where they're triaged. Um, for the outborn, they are triaged or, or, or screened already um, in the main entrance and taken to, S, to the special care baby unit. So inborn, screened in the unit or, or outside of, just outside of the unit, but outborn are already screened um, at the gate. So for COVID positive patients, they're taken to the treatment center or to the confirmed area. And when they're negative uh, twice, they're sent home or they're taken to the ERIC area. And for those uh, patients, as I mentioned, yes, those patients who are positive and convalescent, now negative, taken home or to the ER ICU area. So this is the compartmentalization plan that we have in on a Jewish Children's Hospital at the moment. So for the doctors, for instance, we have teams. We have five different teams. These doctors, um, each team has a, a doctor's room and each room is well, well equipped and well furnished to make them comfortable with microwaves and fridges and everything, to make them comfortable so that they do not move to other areas of the hospital. So basically, if one doctor in this team uh, becomes positive, only th that team we might be able to say, you stay at home, you uh, um, uh, quarantine yourself. However, the other doctors can continue working. It's the same with the nurses. However, it's, 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 it's more strict with the nurse, it was stricter with the nurses because they stay in each and every ward. So the nurses at the malnutrition ward, they stay there. They do not move to other wards. They do not move around. Same for the cleaners. They're, they're, there's no movement in between wards. They have to stay in their areas. With the pharmacists and lab technicians, it's a bit difficult because we do not have many. And, and, and so they sometimes have to move in between um, uh, bubbles and departments. So just to show you quickly how we try to implement it, you can see that these nurses are all wearing different colored hats. So we have the brown hat, the purple hat, the wine hat, the peach hat, and we also have the blue hats for those working in the isolation unit. So this is how we have decided to, to identify the nurses so that the compartmentalization uh, can be visual. So if you're wearing a purple hat, you do not go into an area where the nurses are wearing a blue hat because uh, all the other nurses will shout at you. So moving forward, we dis uh, I mentioned about the patient flow. We created a patient flow chart, um, as mentioned before, that is posted all around the hospital with the case definition. We also created um, uh, um, case management according to the ETAT. Uh, as, as James mentioned um, a bit before, uh, we we um, uh, isolate as per SOP, the setting, the safety, the, and then we started with the airway, the breathing, the circulation. 
just according to ETAT, we um, created a more detailed management of the patients when they're suspect or when they're confirmed. Now for the general SOP, we, we, we spoke about a robust screening of all patients, strict adherence to compartmentalization, wearing of surgical masks if doing patient care and wearing of cloth masks if not doing patient care, wearing of light PPE, uh, yes, and cloth masks when, when going home, uh, wearing of full PPE and the N95 mask when in the isolation units, washing of hands regularly, social distancing, um, and, and the, the case management protocol according to the ETAC. So in conclusion, lessons learned from Ebola is that, you know, changing the flow, patient flow is a complex multidisciplinary effort uh, uh, that, that is required and which is what we implemented in this COVID uh, uh, response, COVID pandemic response. And um, the importance of ETAT plus in patient flow was, was, um, was, was identified once, well, was re-identified and, and we, we continue to do training of the nurses and, and doctors on ETAT that hasn't stopped. Um, yes, obviously modified in terms of social distancing, but that hasn't stopped because it is important. We found that it is very important in terms of uh, patient care and, and the mortality rates in our hospital. So we were caught off guard, as I mentioned. Uh, so we had to do a robust reorganization of the hospital and um, we had to recreate the isolation units that we used in, in, in Ebola. And we, we, swift, we swift, uh, changed over to becoming a treatment unit because of the critical patients, they couldn't be sent anywhere else. And, um, and as I mentioned, we continued the ETAT courses and the undergraduate and postgraduate academic meetings via Zoom. Um, this is a, 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 a quick run through of all Algerian Children's Hospital and what we, um, we did in terms of patient flow and ETAT plus. I will now, I thank you all for listening and I will now hand over to Professor Juliet Rashid, who is a pediatrician and Dean of the Children's Hospital of Lahore in Pakistan. Professor Junaid, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nelly, for such a nice talk. And uh, it was pretty elaborating and it was pretty uh, knowledgeable for us as well. And uh, now I will, my, my topic of uh, discussion is a little next level. I work in Children's Hospital Lahore, which is 1180 bedded tertiary care hospital with all sorts of specialities, pediatric cardiology, endocrinology, nephrology, neurology, gastroenterology, surgery, and whatnot. And we have sorry, referral Dr. cases Dr. Jeanette, from all of our Dr. Jeanette, Dr. Jeanette, sorry, can you make yes. it full screen so we can see your slides properly? Sure, so why not, why not, why not? Thank can you. you. Can you, can you, yeah, thank you. So we have been struck very, uh, uh, like quickly with pandemic. Right now we have 188,000 cases in Pakistan, out of which 6% are children from zero to 15 years. And uh, in our hospital in Punjab, which is one of the provinces, and it's a huge hospital, we had we were declared as a treatment center for all sorts of sick patients coming with COVID. And that definitely affected the patient inflow from other sort of non-communicable disease and, and non-COVID problems. Now, this is the main uh, plan in our hospital. Uh, this is the main emergency triage counter. We have emergency medical officers. And and they assess the patient to be shifted to a pediatric medical emergency or a pediatric surgical emergency, and there can be an interchange. And we also invite the specialists. Uh, let me tell you that we have round the clock consultants available in the emergency, fully qualified consultants 24 7 are available in the emergency triage area, and postgraduate residents are handling. We've got around 400 postgraduate residents in our hospital. So there are specialities as well from where we request for a call for any patient coming to our hospital. And there can be four outcomes, a discharge, a short stay, an indoor admission or an ICU admission. Now, obviously, same is true for the neonatology as well. We do not have a maternity hospital attached, but we have a large number of outbound children coming to our neonatology. And we have an indoor and an ICU there. And COVID obviously has been added as another component of triage in our hospital. Uh, because of a large number of cases in Pakistan. Now, straight away, you know, in each act, initially there were four main bulks of like sick patients, somebody coming with an airway obstruction or an altered consciousness or a severe dehydration or a circulatory collapse. And COVID has now added in the problem because COVID can come with any of the four problems. 
And COVID can be asymptomatic. COVID can be coming in a surgical patient, in a specialty patient, in a chronic renal failure patient. So we have a different sort of a problem because many of the patients coming with some other problem might be tested positive, which has recently happened in our hospital. So we identify a patient, whether a COVID or a non-COVID, and we suspect and confirm if it is uh, available as a uh, confirmed PCR, then obviously it's taken as a confirmed case. Record the history, we prioritize the patient. We do not admit or acknowledge too much rather mild and asymptomatic COVID, but moderate, severe, and critical cases are to be taken care of. Similarly, the patient has to be tracked and the hazards of the healthcare professionals have to be looked into. That is the problem of doning and doping in that given area. Now, this is simply a chart which reflects the moderate, severe, and critical COVID and their clinical features. Now, what exactly goes on in our emergency? A patient arrives in the emergency, there is a registration counter, and this registration counter, are, people are pretty trained because they are with us for the last almost two decades now, that any sick patient is sent to the emergency even without registration, and the registration is followed later on. If a patient is stable, the screening is done by the EMO and the, then extend to another triage. We have a consultant or a postgraduate resident setting. And he, in these circumstances nowadays, uh, there is a gross leave in number of other patients. I'll show you in the graph that because of COVID and because of a lot of lockdown problems, the country has gone through multiple types of lockdown. Now we are running through a smart lockdown. And there is very uh, the difficulty in transport problems uh, in transporting the patients from other areas as our hospital is especially their area. So we assess the patient as per the previous chart, whether it's a moderate state of critical COVID, so we shift it to a special area. And if at all the common uh, admission, admissions are non-COVID, so they are kept in the emergency. <coughs> if any patient is taken as COVID, then there is a special route defined in the hospital. I'm sorry, I didn't have that uh, elaborated picture which Dr. Bell showed, but we have a special separate door, a special ambulance. Our uh, uh, COVID area is totally away from the main emergency block. We have four blocks, emergency block, diagnostic block, administrative block, and indoor block. And then back in that area, we have a COVID area on top floor, and we have converted all our private rooms in a COVID area. So the patient is shifted to a totally different route in a separate ambulance and in a separate road with a separate lift to that given area. If the patient is of known COVID nature, and obviously most patients are known COVID, the severity is assessed as such, and any specialty opinion required, the fellows are available on the duty, and we call them. <laughs> Once again, we treat them, or they are admitted in the general medical indoor or the specialty indoor. Now, this is the cardiac department. Now, this is the pick of our hospital. This is the emergency block only. And uh, this is the counter where the patients are received. Now, these are our triage doctors who are sitting with special arrangements to see the patient because we are having a large number of asymptomatic suspects which, uh, which are not confirmed COVID. So we have to, this is a glass being placed between a doctor and a patient and similar uh, precautions are being taken. Then this is the area, the first Three hours where the PGR and consultant are always available, and the patient from this initial EMO evaluation is brought to the uh, triage area. This is our emergency corridor. Now, let me tell you how COVID has affected Pakistan and our, uh, our province Punjab and our city Lahore. We and post COVID, you can see the inflow of patients. <coughs> Previously, we were having a large number of OPD patients. You can see in the month of February. 70,000 patients came into our OPD. Then similarly, in the month of like March, the numbers started declining in April, and we reached around 12,000 in the month of April, which was a fair lockdown time. Same was the true case with admissions, with elective surgeries was stopped for a while. And accident emergency, also, also you can see, this is the accident emergency graph, and initially there used to be around 20,000 patients a month coming to our emergency. And this has had a dip in April in the lockdown area, and then it's a gradual rise. Now, talking of the other essential healthcare services, you can see the neonatal emergency. This turquoise uh, line is showing that initially the number of cases, and then a dip, and same is true for the asthma clinic, specialty patients, our cardiology patients, and especially 
the patients who were being routinely vaccinated with this red line, you can see we used to have around more than 1,000 cases per month coming for vaccination only, and this dipped below 500, almost a 50% reduction in, uh, in COVID season. Now, these were the cases which were COVID confirmed in our hospital. There were around 30 of them. And you can see the mild and asymptomatic cases near the bulk, and severe cases are less in number. And the age factor goes around mainly five to 10 years of age. Now, how do we sustain quality and essential health services? Workforce distribution, the most important component, as Dr. Nelly has, uh, Dr. Bell has said, that they distributed their workforce. We also had a separate roster in every unit. The team was divided in two. Every team used to come on alternate day, and the COVID team was totally separate. They have a separate entrance, and they have a separate sort of a. Uh, they do not come in contact with any hospital personnel unless they go out of the hospital. Now, here we have a problem because ours is a teaching hospital and we have hundreds of postgraduates, both uh, 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 doing postgraduation in multiple specialties in our hospital. So they live in common hostels with common uh, mess and common living places. And that is the place where we first started having a problem that one of uh, the postgraduate resident, one of our healthcare professional who uh, acquired COVID from some family member, and then there was a burst of COVID among colleagues living in that common area. But as far as the hospital is concerned, and obviously after doing a duty of seven days of COVID in COVID ward, we give them a leave of two weeks and they're isolated at home at their places, even if they are positive or negative. Then we have special clinics, fever clinics, filter clinics, and specialty clinics. These are separated, our own a separate outdoor block is there. On the ground floor, it's only a fever clinic. That is for a patient coming with a suspect or non-suspect COVID. And our specialty clinics are shifted to the first and second floor, where we have all sorts of celiac, chronic kidney disease, leukemia clinic, and thalassemia clinics. And you name the problem, and you'll find a clinic there. And a chronic lung disease, asthma, pulmonology, COPD, diabetes, congenital heart disease, neurology clinic. They're all on a separate floor, with a separate entrance. Dr. 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 Junaid, sorry, we're losing you. Can you speak closer to the mic to finish? Okay, okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Can yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. Thanks. Now we have, uh, then our vaccination room was also in the OPD. Then we have to develop a separate route for the vaccination room. Unfortunately, in the start of COVID, we had a drop in vaccines, but now gradually the number is building back again and uh, the patients are coming back for vaccination. We never stopped our clinic throughout our uh, COVID pandemic. Not a single day our clinic was off, uh, vaccination clinic was off. Regarding the auxiliary services among maintaining the high quality essential health services, we have now developed two separate labs. One is a COVID lab, which is within the COVID area, and it is equipped with all sorts of required investigation for COVID, including a mobile X-ray unit, a mobile eco unit, and we are even managing a mobile dialysis machine now because now we are having chronic renal failure patients on dialysis coming COVID positive to us. Similarly, we have a separate radiology service plan, a CT and an MRI, although there is one CT and one MRI in the hospital, but the SOPs have been uh, managed in order to, first of all, we decide whether or not to go for a, a specific investigation of radiology. And if at all it is required, it is done in full sort of like SOPs. Then continuity of essential critical indoor therapies. Now, once again, we had a full-fledged chemotherapy bay and that bay had to be shifted because it was on the same floor where we planned the COVID area. So that chemotherapy bay was shifted from there. And we have a total separate gate, a separate route for patients coming for chemotherapy. Patients coming for uh, outdoor, we have two separate gates for outdoor and indoor, and the third gate is for the COVID area. So we have three specific arrangements for patient pouring in. Now, as the virus has been circulating in the community, and now it's very difficult to analyze or judge or screen before the patient comes in, whether or not he or she is COVID. So now the problem has uh, rather increased, but initially it was easy to segregate all these patients. Initially we stopped all elective surgeries, only emergency surgeries were being done with all PPE, but now gradually elective surgeries have been started after we have we've written a book on uh, pediatric COVID uh, sort of uh, protocols and that COVID flow uh, the, uh, the, that book contains all sort of protocol, how to shift the patient, how to keep it away. Our routine patients 
from emergency are shifted from within the hospital there is a separate route and our covid patients are shifted to the covid area from outside the hospital in the ambulance now special hospital staff in community training we have trained all our hospital staff staff especially the doctors who come to uh, work in the covid area and especially the one who work in the emergency they are trained for it we have run web webinars for the community because there are many pediatricians who are sending patients to our hospital and we written a handbook of covid as well now our dengue pakistan was struck hard by dengue last year as well in islamabad the capital federal capital was struck very hard but last year lahore we had less number of dengue cases and in our hospital we also had dengue cases right now we a, a dengue counter is running parallel in separate to the covid area and similarly regarding diagnosis of other diseases for example tuberculosis uh, and uh, like uh, their clinics are also away from the covid area they were a separate floor so right now the flow of patients i'm telling i just repeat to summarize there are four blocks emergency opd indoor admin the opd has three floors ground floor for the fever clinic for patients who come with suspect covid anybody having a fever and the next two floors for other sort of speciality clinic in the emergency we have like separate uh, triage area in the emergency for covid patients which is away from the normal triage area of other patients if at all any patient is suspected to be history taking he or she is taking to that area now what are the challenges in covid to sustain the emergency emergency triage the first of all the main challenge is the safety of health workers by now we have had around 100 health workers becoming positive in our hospital and there are multiple others in other hospitals because they are they live in common areas and like uh, many of them they've been traveling together to the hospital initially so we always have a problem it's, it's a huge hospital we have around 4000 plus workers so it's not very really easy to segregate them uh, outside the hospital once they leave the hospital our society has developed a scary and sort of stigma and now patients come to us hiding their history of contact and hiding their positive reports Dr. Jinan, I I apologize for the interruption, but we need to wrap up your presentation to leave time for the next. This is the last slide. Just to tell two sentences. Thank you. This is the last slide. We expect an emergence of vaccine-preventable diseases. We emerge. We expect an increase in malnutrition. Probably neonatal mortality. Child abuse cases are already coming in large number, and grossly affected the target referral to our hospital has also increased. Thank you very much for listening patiently. and i'll be welcoming any questions later thank you and we now handing over to professor shah who will give some remark on um on the flow for newborns and the impact that covid-19 had on this professor shah please um hello everyone Uh, thank you very much for uh, such elaborate uh, presentations from dr junaid and from nelly and i think uh, they've made my job easy because they've covered uh, so nicely almost every aspect of uh, uh, triage and uh, emergency services so it's very similar to what nelly has presented in our center but it's not so well organized and uh, basically um, we have also designated seven i am just talking about the obgyn departments in my uh, tertiary hospital and in other tertiary hospitals the situation is quite similar so we have tried to designate separate areas in our emergency for the covid if we get a covid positive diagnosed case otherwise then we have to screen and then we have to send the test which is a very difficult i'll talk about it a little bit later that uh, testing a patient has become a very uh, bad nightmare for all of us so uh, separate areas for covid patients in the er and in the labor room also we have designated uh, separate beds uh, uh, separate tables for the uh, laboring patients and then after uh, delivery when we shift the patient to the ward again we have a separate ward for the covid and where the those patients are kept and then they are discharged very early rather than kept for 24 hours we usually discharge them in 12 hours so um, Uh, basically in opd also most of the time the patients are not coming uh, with a diagnosis of covid so that's the difficult part although we are trying to do social distancing but the kind of rush that we have uh, uh, it's quite difficult to do social distancing also 
And uh, like Dr. Junaid said, the flow of patients has reduced very significantly, particularly during the lockdown, our flow of patients, antenatal patients, uh, decreased to more than 50%. And uh, even now the flow is uh, somewhat less than its usual flow. And similarly in our pediatric emergency, the flow of patients has reduced to one third during lockdowns. And even uh, now, uh, patients have not resumed their normal pattern of flow that more than 300 patients used to come in emergency in pediatrics, and now they're less than 100, and similarly in antenatal clinics. So I don't know where these patients are going. Previously, the patients who were coming to tertiary care, they must be going somewhere, but uh, really it's a question mark about uh, the, um, uh, the consequences of lockdown and COVID. And secondly, uh, the difficult part is that when we try to speak to the high-risk patients about testing, they are really become very upset and they totally refuse. There's a flat refusal on the part of the uh, family, like James also talked about stigma. So they, they will never, uh, they, they never allow us to do the test. They will just say, you know, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's not right. We can't have Corona and we are going home. We don't want to admit our patient. And similar thing is happening in pediatric emergency. They are bringing sick children, sick infants, but when the doctors are saying we want to test them for COVID because they have fever, the attendants refuse for the test, they refuse for the admission, and they're taking the sick kids, sick uh, uh, children away. And similarly, our patients, we are losing patients because of the stigma attached to the disease. So that's a very, very important aspect. That's uh, And people are uh, abusing the doctors also. There's a lot of fight going on between the doctors because of this test. And then uh, even when we test them and the patients test positive, we send the, we have a, a, a designated isolation area, a big isolation area and ICU, separate ICU for COVID in the whole of the tertiary care hospital. There's a separate area of uh, uh, nearly 14 beds ICU. So where serious patients are referred, and then uh, in uh, we have an HDU and isolation. But when we refer our patients after delivery that you have to go to isolation because you test positive, again, they uh, forcefully take the patient home. And they say, no, we don't want to go in isolation, and we will isolate at home. So that is a big issue, and that's a big problem, that how do we uh, make the public aware about the uh, benefits of isolation and the benefits of the test, basically, about safety of their family. Because the scare is and the uh, feeling is that uh, the whole family will be taken away by the government into the isolation and they will not be allowed to meet their patients. And um, so they, that's the reason that they give for, uh, they said, no, uh, we can't have Corona and it's all a conspiracy of doctors and the government that they have created this Corona thing and we don't believe in Corona. So uh, those are the dilemmas that we are facing, and I uh, I would like to discuss how to go about it, how to create this awareness through media or through social media, and how to go about it. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much, Professor Shah and uh, uh, Professor Junaid and Dr. Nelly Bell. Um, we're getting quite a lot of questions coming through from the chat, and uh, a number of the early ones related to uh, whether we had cases who were negative, who then were found to be positive on the general wards. And, uh, uh, and certainly we have seen in Sierra Leone uh, patient, adult patients uh, who are admitted on a normal ward and then who prove positive. Uh, and that is a challenge uh, for, uh, uh, for the healthcare workers who will be caring for those and how you manage that. Um, there is also a question about parents who are positive. And I, I note that we've had actually very few cases who have been diagnosed with COVID in the hospitals admitted with a, a COVID-like illness. I think 30 in, uh, in Lahore and seven in, in Sierra Leone. In countries where there are 175,000 uh, cases in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Pakistan. So we would expect far larger proportions of the children possibly to have COVID, many of whom may be asymptomatic and therefore undiagnosed on the wards. And I wondered, Dr. Bell, if you would like to comment about how you uh, manage that, because you spoke about compartmentalization and bubbles for your staff. And I know that the hospital closed for a period uh, because of potential infection from patients to staff, but possibly more importantly, between staff. Would you like to make comment on that, Nelly? 
Yes, um, uh, James, thank you very much. So the, the reason, uh, the, the original reason why we had to shut down was because there was so much uh, infection in the hospital, so many COVID positive uh, cases. And um, so uh, obviously there was cross infection going on amongst the staff, maybe originating from a, from a patient. And, um, and that, that actually came out only when the first case from the hospital became positive and then we started doing mass testing. So that is that is when we actually found out that all of these cases were positive. Now, um, in, in terms of the patients in infecting the, so that was before we did the the unit the masking masking up before we, we we finished training the IPC. So now that has all all changed. We've done the tra IPC training. We've we've provided masks for the for the staff, and uh, we 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 we've done this com this bubbling this compartmentalization. And that has that has greatly improved um, our management. So now uh, the question was, um, if, if 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 for instance the doctor gets uh, becomes positive, I mentioned that as well. Um, yes, he, he or she will be in his bubble or in her bubble, and only those in that bubble will have to be quarantined, and the rest of them will, and the rest of the doctors will not have to be quarantined. And these bubbles are made up of about six, five, six doctors, so it's not a huge number. So um, that way, the, the staff cannot infect each other. But masking, we're very strict with the masks and social distancing in the hospital, of staff in the hospital, and of patients as well in the hospital. So that prevents the cross, uh, rapid cross infection. Over. Over to you, James. Uh, thank you. Uh, and can I? Pass that to uh, Professor Junaid, as you have a, a, a hospital managing very complex patients and you are maintaining uh, services for those. Uh, how do you manage uh, the likely uh, parents, uh, carers, and also children who may have asymptomatic infection coming through? Do you have processes pr to prevent healthcare worker infections, and are you monitoring healthcare worker infections and infection potentially uh, within those areas where you do not have diagnosed COVID cases? Over. Uh, thanks, Dr. James. First of all, let me share you one experience. Initially, our government did not allow us home isolation. So we had around two dozen of children who were totally asymptomatic, and they were kept with us in our hospital, each patient in a separate room with one of the parents. Now, they stayed there for 15 days each, even more. Throughout that stay, none of the adults got the infection from their asymptomatic child. So this was a good news for us. Initially, people were scared, but gradually we came to know that all the adults who were, like uh, the, all the adults which we kept with us were asymptomatic. And initially they were all tested. They were all negative. And when they stayed with their children for 15 days, they never turned positive. And this was a good news and that we also disseminated to many people. And we are getting studies world over that children are not rapidly transferring their infections to other people. Number two, uh, talking about the asymptomatic adults. Previously, we used to have a large uh, rush in our ward. My ward is a 57 bedded and having 170 plus patients was normal. But as the number of patients has decreased, we have rather segregated them in uh, different uh, areas of the ward. And we tried to keep one bed, one patient policy. The number of attendants has been uh, decreased. The strict policy is being monitored. They have been asked to do hand washing right at the beginning uh, at, at the entrance of the hospital. Regarding the healthcare professionals in every department, we are providing basic surgical sort of uh, gowns and masks and uh, N95 masks and caps and all sorts of shields to uh, for uh, intubation to all doctors working in every area of the hospital. They have got N95 masks, surgical gowns, caps, and they've got their shields, et cetera, face shields for sort of any procedures. For surgeries, all the surgeries are done before uh, the COVID test is done and then the surgery is performed. And all the surgeons and anesthetists people, they are given full-fledged PP before they start working for that. So this is what we can try uh, the, the maximum. But the children themselves, they are not transferring. Similarly, speciality, right now we have around eight patients in the COVID area, ICU, uh, moderate to ICU area, and two of them chronic renal failure, one of celiac, uh, sorry, uh, chronic liver disease, surgical patients. And they have come from different wards, and they, came, they were 
they came with their primary disease and were tested covid during this stay so it's not very easy now to evaluate any patient uh, and uh, we just suspect either on the history on the, the the area they are coming from because we know in lahore which areas are typical popular for sort of covid uh, clusters and we asked about cluster of cases in the family and gradually once discovered we go for covid testing and then they are shifted to the covid area and uh, the patient the doctors there are regularly screened every day we screen out about 40 to 50 healthcare professionals which have a history of contact to any patient to any other healthcare professional and majority of them they turn negative although there is a positive bulk as well over thank thank you very much indeed and we 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 are running towards the end of this uh, webinar um but I'd, there were getting some questions relating to the impact on services and dr shah uh, talked about uh reductions in the numbers coming through by a third and certainly uh we're seeing that for immunizations and community activities but particularly for hospital attendance in sierra leone uh, one of the uh hospitals supported by an ngo found significant reductions and did a large piece of work on social mobilization and community uh uh engagement uh so people understood that the hospital was an area where there was a segregation and uh and there were protections against covid but i wondered if dr shah would like to comment about this in relationship to use of 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 services by uh babies uh presenting through with acute symptoms and how that is uh, how how one has been able to mitigate uh the effects of covid on reduction of utilization of health services dr shah Oh thank you. Uh thank you for uh asking your question. Hello. Yes, so um right now uh whatever data we have available, I don't think uh our neonates are testing positive. Even if the mothers have tested positive throughout the tertiary care centers in all the four provinces of Pakistan, even those who have tested positive, their neonates have not tested positive. Either the neonates have not been tested because the facilities for uh, testing is not available 24/7 in all the hospitals and where they have been and even in my hospital all the tests have been uh, have the, they've come out as negative so um uh, but even uh, for the few babies who have tested positive breastfeeding is actually not contraindicated and that's the who guideline also says that the mother can wear a mask and she can breastfeed the baby she just has to uh, follow the proper uh, sanitization and hygiene and uh, breastfeeding is actually very important for the neonates but uh, somehow very few infants have tested positive and initially also uh, the, research, uh, the research from china also said that uh, it's not being sick, the virus is not being secreted in the breast milk or even in the amniotic fluid so vertical transmission and uh, breastfeeding uh, are both uh, are basically uh, there's no vertical transmission proven up till now and uh, the breastfeeding has been uh, uh, recommended as safe so um, yes and the testing uh, has not shown any uh, or very few neonates to be positive and when they turn positive and we uh, recommend isolation for the mother and the baby usually the patients they just go home so they refuse for the isolation they say we we have isolation at home so uh, that is the issue that i was talking about the stigma related to it and ab about the isolation thank you james thank you very much dr shah i think we will be finishing here and i will let ben a close uh, but there was a comment which was made earlier about uh, patients refusing to have a test and i think that will be a challenging uh, uh, issue unless they self discharge which is clearly not in the child's interests uh, as we then will have a group of patients who uh, i assume will be held in isolation uh during treatment rather than being able to be sent to a a ward where they are defined as covid positive or negative uh, as it would be unreasonable to put them into a red zone covid positive area but i will leave that until uh, uh the community of practice questions which i think benny will feed back to us now over 
Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you very much to all our panelists. Quickly to close this session today, um, I would like to guide you, to direct you to two resources uh, to continue the discussion. You will see the quick links here. You will also receive all this information later today uh, in a link with the PowerPoints and the recording. So two, two guidance that are relevant to the discussion. Also, um, way to stay engaged uh, with the discussion. One of them being to check the next webinar in, in this series on 9th of July will, will be on quality maternal care to join the community of practice. Uh, again, you will get this link today in the link that we'll be sharing you and uh, to also join the Child Health Task Force at the, the URL that is also linked here. You will have all this information in details uh, in, one, in one email this afternoon. Again, I would like to thank everybody for their time and our fantastic panelists today for how much they managed to share in such a brief time. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.